ahead and shut up and hand it over to Mr. Sean Berry. Thank you, Seth. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, this is, as Seth said, the second session of, uh, of webinars on TrueSight Smart Reporting. Uh, these kind of follow a similar structure to the, uh, to the workshops that we will traditionally do during a TrueSight 2020, uh, similar to what we used to call a Sharpen Your Blade workshop. Uh, in those workshops, we would, uh, we would strive to help customers get uh, and understand value from uh, their solution. And one of the key elements of that has always been reporting. Uh, I tend to think of automation as having two major goals, uh, one, to do the work, and secondly, to be able to demonstrate what work has been done. So to that end, uh, our most successful customers use reporting, right? And they use reporting to show both the results of their automation efforts and also to demonstrate the impact and the value that they're having on the business. Uh, and to that end, uh, like I said, most of our customers use reporting and they will use specific reports uh, that will provide information out to their users. Uh, and so that may consist of helping, helping their users or internal customers understand their patching level, uh, understanding how close they are to regulatory compliance, which of course can be a very important thing depending on the organization you're in. Uh, it, they can use it to help their customers understand uh, their level of patch compliance. Uh, and one of the things that's not obvious about that is that patch compliance very often, like achieving patch compliance, if you've got 100% uh, cooperation from your customers, it's super easy, right? As long as you can get a maintenance window, everybody signs up, uh, the patches can get deployed. It's really, really easy to go. But uh, that's not how most of our customer environments work, right? Everybody's got other things they need to do. They've got conflicting work that needs to happen in the same maintenance windows. And so it can be hard to prioritize that patching work. One of the things that reporting can help you do is it can help your users understand when their maintenance windows are, and then it can also help them understand uh, their, how their level of participation in the patching process is impacting their overall uh, patching performance relative to other departments. So we're gonna go through some reports today that help us understand um, some of those different use cases and how they, uh, how they tie out to, um, uh, how they tie out to helping automation be successful in the business. So uh, this is going to be uh, a very light on slides workshop. Uh, we're going to start out talking about the data models really, really quickly. Uh, we're then going to talk about, we're then going to go in and just start building reports. So we'll build a detailed inventory report. Uh, I used to call this the 30 column inventory report because it tends to have about uh, 10 columns of basic server information. Uh, in most of our customer environments, we'll then have 10 or 15 elements of uh, hardware information, uh, including CPU sockets and cores. That's very handy if you're getting uh, license audited by IBM or Oracle. And then it'll also have typically uh, some server property information like customer, like who your internal customer is, who the environment is, maybe who the server owner is, uh, and any specific maintenance windows you have. Uh, so that will give you a nice detailed inventory report. And then, you know, I've, I've talked to a number of customers where um, they, end up get, they end up building different individual reports to go pull different individual pieces of information. Um, and it can be very exhaustive. It can be very uh, time consuming to turn out, you know, new and different reports every, every week or two. Uh, and we find in those environments, a lot of our customers are snapshotting the same, th the same things over and over again for different jobs. Uh, one of my goals with the detailed inventory report is to capture enough of that information that you can hit, you know, 60, 80% of your people who are commonly asking for inventory information. And, uh, you know, so that you can divert most of your incoming requests to a, a place where you can say, hey, just go look at the standard report that we've already, we're already, you know, uh, generating and making available every week anyways. Uh, and then you'd have that much less overhead in your process. Uh, so we're going to do a patch compliance report, like we said. Um, one of the things, one of the things that really became clear to me when I started working with one of our larger East Coast banks is that, um, the line of business line of businesses level of interest in patching can have a significant impact on how compliant they are and how compliant the overall line of business is. 
Now, your CIO or CISO may be the person who's accountable for the overall uh, success of the patching effort and how fast you're closing vulnerabilities and, you know, applying security fixes to your environment. Uh, but that effort depends on the, on the cheerful cooperation of all the different individual CIOs and CISOs. Uh, and it is not uncommon, especially in this era of merged banks, to have 10, 15, or 20 different CISOs, all of whom, of course, have different missions that are specific to their teams. Um, and uh, being able to quickly understand which departments are doing better and, uh, you know, which maybe could pay a little more attention to their patching uh, tends to make that conversation go a lot easier. Uh, so lastly, we're going to talk about regulatory compliance. We're going to take an example um, that my good friend Chris Blanks and I built uh, when he was working at a customer. Uh, and we're going to start by, by figuring out what our regulatory compliance is by operating system. Now, this is going to be a little different than our patching report because we're going to look just by operating system. And the reason for that is a lot of the security and, and configuration fixes uh, can often be common to a particular operating system team. And uh, it also tends to foster some healthy competition between those teams. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll get in and do some Q&A. Uh, and as uh, Seth said, feel free to ask questions in the chat, and we'll have people uh, answer and knock those down as we go through. All right. So the data model overview, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to go show you this right in, uh, right in the product momentarily. But uh, basically, uh, in Yellowfin, Yellowfin calls them models. Uh, these are similar to, to domains. Uh, in BDSSA Cognos. And what they are is they're basically, they're a set of data uh, that are all of a common origin or all have a common schema. So, um, you know, many of the things within inventory are all based on either native information that server automation, that uh, uh, TrueSight server automation knows about a server just through the course of daily business or things that it captures to do snapshot jobs. Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of things in patching that are relevant to each other, uh, and then in the domain of compliance is the other major area that we, we, will do, um, we will do reporting out of. There's also change tracking if you're doing PCI file integrity monitoring or uh, any other sort of uh, unauthorized authorized and unauthorized change tracking. Uh, that's another major domain. Uh, one thing to note is that um, Within the data model, there's the one big change coming over from Cognos uh, to Yellowfin is that uh, patching is now broken out into two different domains. Um, there's a patch detail, which will give you information about specific individual patches, um, like, uh, you know, a hotfix number and the Q number and KB number relative to that, uh, uh, to that individual patch, maybe a particular CVE that an individual patch is aligned to. But then there's also a patch summary domain. And that's handy because if we don't, if we may not necessarily care about the specific patch ID of a specific patch that's been deployed, and instead we want to understand holistically at the business level how our patching compliance rate is being done across the across the organization, uh, we may not want to drill all the way down into that and, and see that last level of detail. So we'll get to explore that as we go on through. Uh, next thing we're going to, all right, so uh, let's go look at that in, uh, let's go look at that in uh, in Yellowfin, aka Smart Reporting. So uh, when we go, I'm going to close this real quick, and that'll let us refresh. Uh, when we go build a custom report, uh, and make sure to put good default values in your filters. Uh, when you go build a custom report, you're going to get a list of all of the different data domains, as we discussed, right? And so we have the change tracking model, which has been used a lot, the inventory compliance, as we said, patch summarized and detail. We, of course, have the, all the classics in here. Um, I think a lot of people are going to end up using job activity. There's, of course, the role-based access control one, aka RBAC. Uh, if you do provisioning or SCAP, you're going to have those. Uh, but mostly, I'm, I tend to work in, you know, these four or five uh, particular areas of the model. And so uh, because I tend to use those and because I tend to use them uh, more specifically, what I've done is I've clicked the, uh, the favorite star over here uh, so that they sort up into the top and I can, I can kind of see those at a high level and they'll always come up easily. Today we're going to go build an inventory report. 
So I'm gonna pick the inventory model. And while that's loading, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Let's talk about this real quick. So my goal for the detailed inventory report is a couple of things, right? One, it is to address all of the user requests that come in that say, you know, hey, what are all the servers that automation knows about that have, you know, that are in the dev environment, that are in the production environment, that are Windows 2008, that are in the Houston data center or the Charlotte data center or whatever, right? I'm sure, you know, most of us get requests like that every single day, we get them in quantity. Um, and it can be tedious to, you know, build custom reports for every single user. If you can build one common report that has, you know, a lot of those common fields, uh, you can address a lot of those requests without having to build a new report every single week, save yourself a lot of time and effort. Uh, the other big thing is uh, there are common server properties that are used in server smart groups. And these fields, um, the, these property fields that you might use uh, dictate when servers get patched, how they get patched, how they're evaluated for compliance, what software deployments get it, get sent to them, uh, and very often who gets to access those servers. So that data needs to be correct. Now you may be sourcing that out of a CMDB or you know some sort of third-party spreadsheet or something else, but the information that's in that's in server automation should be accurate. And the easiest way to find out whether that's accurate is to send this data back to uh, your customers. So if you can in, include this information in your report um, and publish that back to your customers on a weekly basis, they will tell you if things are wrong, right? If they see a server that's listed as being in production but it's in dev or vice versa, you know, obviously it's gonna be subject to different maintenance windows, um, different risk categories, and you're gonna need that information to be correct. Uh, I have found this to be a, a pretty productive uh, and helpful way to get good feedback on, on whether your server property information is correct in uh, automation. Uh, the other thing is, like I said, the, um, uh, the hardware info, uh, as we mentioned, that requires a snapshot of the inventory template. So there's a set of out-of-the-box inventory templates in server automation, and you will, need to ca you will need to take a snapshot of this. Now, most of this information does not change very often, so you may be able to snapshot this once a month or once a week, uh, and have very good information in your system. Uh, I have seen customers that snapshot this every day. I don't know that that's strictly necessary unless you have a very high rate of change um, for your servers. Um, and I have seen uh, uh, customers that do it even more often than that. Uh, most of the time what you're gonna be doing is you're basically just gonna be clogging up your database with, uh, with a lot of job runs. Uh, common information that we will capture includes make, model, memory, so that if I've got a Dell PowerEdge 6, R610, it's got 192 gigs of RAM and it's running, you know, Intel, whatever, Xeon. Uh, one thing that often comes up in both IBM and Oracle licensing discussions is CPUs, sockets, and cores. Now, I know a lot of us are mostly virtual at this point, so a lot of the stuff is gonna come back as VMware, you know, VMware servers and uh, mainly VMware settings, uh, but there are still um, environments where, uh, our customers will, our, our uh, vendor partners will ask us for this information in order to understand how we're licensing uh, their solutions. Uh, one other handy thing, if we're able to see the network domain, um, you'll see that in this environment. Uh, if we are able to see the network domain, that can be a, um, <clears throat> uh, that's an easy one to have in there. So uh, these are two different sets of things that get captured two different ways. And then of course we have the basic server details like uh, host name, IP address, uh, uh, operating system version and so forth. Uh, so once we have all this information, then we can filter it. Uh, and you can basically build the report once and filter it many ways and use that to send it back to your customers. So that's the first report we're gonna start with. And I am remotely logged in to uh, my demo environment that Sumit very generously built for us and we're getting a lot of good mileage out of. Now, the first thing you're gonna notice is, um, for reasons passing understanding, uh, the labels on these folders are a lot wider than they were in Cognos. Um, there's reasons for it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the thing I'm first gonna start with is I'm gonna start with inventory server down here. And that's gonna give me the high level, uh, the highest level information. And I always start with server name. Uh, and then I will add on to that IP address. Um, 
and you're going to notice that I've got auto refresh turned on. Now, 99% of the time, auto refresh is awesome because it helps you look at the data in real time. It helps you understand uh, what's going on. There will be advanced reports that you're going to get into that you're going to want to disable that because it'll either take too long per cycle to build things out or for whatever reason, it's just annoying. Uh, or you may need to break something on your way. Uh, let's see. So I've got uh, server name and IP address. I've got OS name. Uh, and then I've got OS version. And so this is, uh, what do we have? Linux, Red Hat. Red Hat Linux, ES 7.6, Windows 2008, 2012, uh, all very standard stuff. Uh, some people will put the OS vendor in their report. And notice that if I drag these things in between other rows, uh, I can get, um, uh, I, can, I can put columns basically anywhere I want. Uh, other things that are handy, uh, those of you who do Windows patching, uh, you will be very aware that you want to be on 8903 patch two or 8904 for the coming Shablik change. Uh, and one of the things that we will do as we go is we want to understand what agents may not be on the current version that we need to be on. And as you can see, looking in this uh, environment, we've got some, uh, some inventory data from some other places, and we do have some agents that are uh, older or out of, out of version. So all of these are things that, um, uh, all of these are things that, um, uh, that server automation knows uh, knows natively about uh, about this environment uh, and about these agents, and that is very very handy. So uh, that can help us uh, quickly understand um, quickly understand the nature of our environment. The other thing I'm going to drag in is I'm going to drag in the latest server version. Now, one thing you're going to see is you're going to see that there are. Um, oh, it looks like we lost Seth. Uh, there's a filter called latest server version. Now, if the server got upgraded from Windows 2003 to 2008 or 2008 to 2012 or whatever it does along the way, uh, we want to make sure that we have the most current information. Uh, and that's a very helpful uh, filter because snapshot data will show data over time. And, you know, if a server got upgraded, I mean, this is fairly unlikely, but if it got upgraded from 2003 to 2008 to 2012, you wouldn't want to show all three different results you'd want to show the current version, and that's what the latest server version filter uh, gives us. Uh, other things you can do, uh, I always like to put in the date created somewhere, and that helps us understand when a server came into our environment and how old our data is. Um, <clears throat> and obviously there are other filters that we can use in there. I think that's most of the base server inventory one. Uh, so the other things we'll do, now if there's something in here that you're looking for and you know the name of it, but you don't know exactly where it is, you can always come up here and um, come up here and search. And so, um, you know, uh, one, one common one I'm going to have is number of uh, uh, logical uh, and socketed CPUs, uh, and those are all in the machine summary. So I can either drag these over or I can go, you know, once I figure out what folder they're in, uh, go get, go look at that particular field. Uh, this machine summary, and one of the things that, you know, if you're building one of these reports and, you know, for whatever reason, things don't quite look right, um, uh, things don't quite look right, you're not, not quite sure, um, uh, you're not quite sure what to, what to do with a, with a particular piece of data that you see. Um, one thing you can always do is come in and, um, you know, go look at the equivalent information in server automation. And the machine summary, you know, we, we use a third-party library to capture that, uh, that hardware information. And I just love the data that comes out of that thing. It is super helpful, uh, super verbose, and um, it's built by a company that spends all their time making sure that, um, that the hardware information is captured correctly. Uh, and in a useful format. So when I want to go look at something, I'll go look out in server automation. And, you know, obviously if you're living in reporting all the time, you probably don't want to, uh, um, you know, you're, you're probably not looking at this stuff all that often. But when we go out and um, <clears throat> live browse on the server, all this stuff, all this hardware information comes out of the hardware information object. Shocking, right? So when we go click on it, what it's going to do is it's going to go out, and because all of this is live, it's going to go out and do that survey. Uh, but there's basically going to be four major columns under hardware information once it paints in. 
sorry, five major, and that's going to include specific hardware information about the operating system, uh, some Windows shared folder stuff. Uh, but the last thing is the machine summary. And so the machine summary is going to have host name, make and model, so it's VMware virtual platform. Uh, it's going to have total amount of uh, virtual memory and installed memory, CPU sockets and cores, when the system last booted, um, and uh, the particular domain that it happens to be in. So you can use, you know, these are fairly common, fairly basic high level things that you're going to need. Turns out they map one for one over into our report data. So if I want to go in here, uh, I don't know what machine type is, but let's add that in. And that's the other thing I like about this interface is it makes it easier for it makes it super easy for us to come in and um, uh, come in and understand this information quickly. Uh, yep, serial number. A lot of VMware boxes in there. Uh, but we're going to need manufacturer, so who, who makes that system, right? Uh, and then what model is it? And I always like when I can find something that's not on the standard list. Uh, looks like everything in this environment happens to be VMware. But, you know, this can be particularly helpful, for example, if you're a Dell or HP shop or something, and you're trying to get off of the, you know, say you got a bunch of still, like, eighth generation. I think they're up to, what, 12? 12 or 13th generation of, of Dell hardware. If you've got some of that older generation hardware in your environment and you want to identify it for lease returns or whatever, this can be super helpful information. Uh, so we've got make and model. Uh, we're going to need the, uh, uh, I want the total amount of installed memory. And so there's both installed memory or there's total RAM. Uh, total RAM can go over there. Uh, and I think it's going to show, and I believe that shows in uh, kilobytes. So one thing we can do with that is we can go throw a calculation at it and have it um, have it divide by uh, a million, and it'll show show it to us in uh, gigabytes. So let's see. There is, I think it's advanced function. We'll let us do a math function, and we can do basic math, and divide by, yep, uh, divide by. Hey, Sean, uh, there is an easier way to convert this. Uh, just go on the aggregation, just cancel this. Yep, yep. It's showing a sum, just click on that, click on the aggregation, and uncheck yep. the sum, or say none. Okay. Just, just click on yeah. none, and it will, it okay. will do that. Perfect. There we go. Perfect. All right. So that's our total RAM in gigs, and that solves a bunch of problems for you. And then we need uh, CPU sockets and cores. And like I said, in in a virtual environment, this doesn't matter so much, um, but. You know, most of us still have some kind of uh, uh, some kind of mixed environment, uh, and we can also have logical CPUs. And this isn't like we said; this isn't uh, uh, super meaningful in a VMware environment because it basically presents all of them as being the same. Uh, but if you have, um, you know, say you have a hex core, you say you have hex hex core Xeons, they may have six cores per socketed CPU, so you may have two socketed CPUs, a total of um, and a total of twelve uh, virtual CPUs, and then you know you'll get into threads and those other things. Um, other thing I find handy is to put in the machine domain. Uh, not a major thing, but most of us manage environments that have multiple trees. Uh, have multiple different things going on. You know, for here, we happen to have a server that's in work group instead of being in our uh, our primary active directory domain that we've got managing there. So that's most of what I need out of machine summary. You know, we, uh, we experimented with while we were setting this up. We went and looked at, uh, you know, could we go grab some more specific CPU information? You know, you may have somebody who wants, you know, a list of all the, all the Xeons that are uh, of a particular generation that maybe they, they're subject to a particular exploit, or um, uh, they want to identify all the AMD versus Intel or whatever CPUs in their environment, you can pull plenty of that information over there. But as you can see, we're starting to get a pretty good uh, footprint of information on our reports, and of course, we can see how much 
memory is allocated across our environment. So the thing I'm going to skip forward to is let's go look at server properties. Now, not surprisingly, this is called inventory server property. Uh, and what this does is this shows us a bunch of great information in here. Now, in order to identify whether uh, a property is shown in, um, uh, whether a property is shown in reporting, that property needs a thing set called uh, used in reports. And so we've got a lot of properties down here. It looks like we've got, we've got to probably have 200 properties on this server. We don't obviously want to pull all of those over into uh, over into reporting because we may not use them, right? And, and it'll add overhead to our um, uh, it'll add overhead to our, our process to uh, uh, replicate that information over. It'll just clog up both databases for something we may not ever even use. But if you go into server properties and you go pick a particular um, you go pick, pick a particular property like uh, you know customer is my favorite one. Now customer for you may mean your internal line of business, your internal customers, and you'll notice that there's a column here, and that column is used in reports. And so when you double click one of these, you're going to see this little checkbox right down here. You need to check that in order to have that property replicate over into reporting. Now, why do we want to pull these over? Again, because a lot of server smart groups are based on this information. You know, I've got in here, I've got servers by location, by environment, by business service, uh, by application tier, right? And all of those things are determined by server properties. Uh, and so if I'm going to group my servers and work them uh, using this format, I need to have them based on good data. So when I go back over into reporting, uh, once I've checked that used in reports and I have it show up, uh, I'm going to see it show up in my list here. So one of the first things that I'm going to start with is I'm going to start with environment. Uh, and I'm going to start with environment because my servers are dev QA stage or prod, and that's a pretty important factor. Uh, and as I drag it in here, it's going to go refresh. Looks like a lot of these are development servers. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go pull in my internal customer. That one got added earlier, so it shows up earlier on the list. Now, if you're ever looking for something and you can't find it, like if I know that I've got a property in the maintenance window and for, over, for whatever reason, you know, I can't find it on the list, I can always go search and it'll just show up right on my list. Uh, so I, I think a lot of us use maintenance windows. This is a real easy way to communicate um, communicate out the value of a particular server property um, uh, and an easy way to provide that information back to our customers, our internal customers, so that they can give us feedback on, you know, whether we have the right data and whether we're, we're using and based off of that right information. Uh, so that's, I think that's most of the, never hurts to throw the fully qualified host name in here off the end of it. And that's getting to be a pretty good size report. We got a lot of fields on here. Um, we got a lot of a lot of fields on here. It's starting to get to be kind of a long report, uh, but it's also starting to look like something that's going to be useful, right? It's going to be something that I can send this to a customer, and maybe if they're primarily interested in the hardware information, they can use that. If they're primarily interested in you know some of these details like the environment and the line of business, say we want to take that. I'm gonna, I kind of want to take that and put that a little bit to the left. Um, Server owner is another great field. Uh, I don't have it set up here, but it's a very common one. Uh, and that lets people say, you know, I own the server, somebody else owns the server, and we're kind of roll for it. So once you have this built out, you can uh, save it and run it and basically send it on to, um, uh, send it on to your internal customers. Uh, one other thing I've been known to do, if I've got, uh, if I've got something like the internal customer or um, the maintenance window, and these things are not set. I will sometimes do um, a conditional formatting, and we'll get into doing that uh, in some of our other reports. But what I'll sometimes do is, if those fields are blank, I might highlight them in red, and then that'll that'll prompt the people that own these systems to to give us feedback and uh, help us uh, help us fill that information in. So once I've got this report built, I'm pretty happy with it. I I like how it looks, as you can see. You know, I probably spent more time talking than I did actually building this report. Um, and now I can go uh, publish this as a detailed inventory report and, um, you know, put some nice info shows all, let's see, 
shows all common inventory aspects and some key server properties. Nice description never hurts because it helps other people understand before they go and run a report whether something's going to be useful to them. And then where our question is, where are we going to put it? Now, this is an inventory dashboard, so I'm going to put it in inventory. You may also have a separate field just for custom reports, but I like to put things in next to the other reports that are in there. Uh, I generally make my stuff public. Uh, I, may, um, uh, I may set up some distribution rules. I always like to turn on web services if I can. Uh, not sure whether that'll break something, but, and, you know, I want people to be able to email them uh, and probably want that only to be uh, to validate users. Go see if there's any report settings and how often it gets refreshed. Okay, great. So we'll hit save. Hey, Sean, quick question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Could you uh, rename the report columns? Like, could you change the, the name of the date created column to build date? Yes, you can. Yep. Yep. So when you, uh, when you build these things out, um, uh, let's see, I think it's in the design phase. Uh, you, can, you can go in and rename any of these columns. So. Awesome. Thank uh, you. Let's see. Yep. And that. Uh, I forget where it is. Yeah, there, there's a place for it. We'll we'll end up having to do that in the patch one. Um, we'll end up having to do that in the in the patch one anyways. Um, there we go. Number of socketed processors, right? So if for some odd reason you wanted this to say socket proc so that it would match, um, you know, some existing report that you had, and you wanted to make this one, um, you know. Uh, socket uh, num cores or whatever, right? If whatever whatever way that you wanted this thing to show up, you go save that and you see them relabel right there. Good. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and save that. All the same settings. As you can see, the defaults are pretty reasonable. Um, and I like doing this report, honestly, guys, because this is a relatively easy report, right? It looks pretty. It looks like you put a lot of work into it. But if you understand what's going on in your automation environment at all, right, this is a, this is a pretty easy, pretty straightforward report to build out. Uh, it shows a lot of information. It helps demonstrate to your partners uh, some of the value that server automation can provide to them. And frankly, it's a pretty useful report. Right. If you go through and you're looking for something, and customer, your internal customers say, you know, hey, where where is this piece of information? You know, how do I get this thing? Right. You can give them something that they don't have to ask you questions for. Uh, and as much as we all love going to meetings and having conversations with people, it's really nice to be able to give people something that uh, you know that they can get good value out of without having to talk to you. All right, great. So that's detailed inventory report. The next one we're going to do, any, any last questions on inventory before we get into patching? I trust you guys are getting some questions on the, on the chat as we go. Uh, sure. So let's, let me go ahead and hit you up with a couple here. Um, yeah. Okay. And we don't need to burn a lot of time. We can always do more stuff later, right? Yes. Um, let's see. Okay. It looks like Sumit's answered. I'm seeing Most some. Of them. Yeah, I'm seeing some questions around patching. Should we hold those until the next session? Yeah, let's go talk about patching. Okay. So I'm I'm going to do patching right now, uh, and I'm going to start with I'm going to start with a high level patching report. Now there are detailed level reports, right, where we go in and look at the uh, uh, look at specific patches and specific servers. I saw a question from Mutu. Uh, I'm not sure whether we're going to cover that one. But I like to start at the high level. And starting at the high level, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at um, patch compliance data by server. And at the highest level, all I really, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm a director or a VP, like I probably don't even care about individual servers, right? I probably care about are we doing a good job of patching our servers? And the only right answer to that question is yes, right? So how do you demonstrate, how do you demonstrate that you're getting the right answer um, how do you demonstrate that you're getting the, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing with that? 
Uh, and the easiest way is to demo is to tell people, you know, be able to uh, uh, quickly demonstrate to our customers that our servers are getting patched. Well, the way that we do that is we're going to basically take information that comes as a result of a patching job. Uh, and so when we do when we do a patching job in server automation, that patching job is going to result in a list of patches that are missing. Uh, and a list of patches that are installed. And there are several different ways to um, uh, to basically kind of kind of for instance that, and we can argue about like how many patches is compliance and how many patches is not compliance. Um, but the net of it is going to be uh, if there are no missing patches, you're in patch compliance. And the easiest way to demonstrate that is to go in and look at uh, on a server by server basis, how many patches are missing or present. Uh, and so if we drill down and we come in here and we see that, you know, I've got, uh, I've got a certain number of patches installed and a certain number of patches missing, you know, I look here, I've got probably 40 patches missing on that server. That server is far from compliant, right? That's also our BDSA server, and I think we avoid installing patches on it for other reasons in our demo environment. But that's basically going to be the net source of, of where we're going to do our math on patching. So if this is the source information, then in my inventory report, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to basically use that information as um, uh, as a source, and I'm going to capture the operating system information that you saw in the inventory report. Uh, I'm going to pull in uh, the customer data uh, because obviously it matters which line of business, and you know maybe even which environment. Um, is doing is doing better or worse. Uh, that patch success rate is what we're showing, what, what I just showed in the patching job, basically how many patches are missing versus how many are installed. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw away the server name because what we wanna do is we wanna build basically a summary report. And when we throw away the server name, what that's gonna do is that's gonna roll up information for us and not automatically. Uh, and that roll up will uh, be the, the core information that we need. So let's, Let's go look at this. This may be a little bit confusing right at the moment. Forgive me for that. Uh, but let's go actually build this thing, right? So we talked about detailed patching versus summary. Uh, summary is basically the, the patch compliance information. Uh, and so what we have is we're going to have a domain. You know, this one's a little simpler because there's, uh, there's some different information in here relative to what's in um, uh, relative to what's in uh, inventory, but we're going to start with patch server information. Now, like I said, I'm going to start with individual server names. Now, I always start here because I want to get the, I want to be able to look at the data first to validate whether I'm reporting on the right stuff. There's nothing more embarrassing than going in and showing somebody a, um, uh, going in and showing somebody a summary report uh, and it turns out the underlying data is completely wrong. So the easiest way to get that is to come in and look at the installed and missing patch count. So I go drag those in there, and then I might also get this list filtered down. So let's see, and I want to take that aggregate out. Probably none. That's starting to look a little more reasonable. So that, uh, that particular Linux server has a lot of patches installed on it. All right, so I have this BAO server that's very well patched, or sorry, this is not very well patched. It has no patches installed and many missing patches. Easy to understand there. Now the nice thing is I think we have some metrics uh, that will show us percent patch compliance. Now in Cognos, I actually had to calculate these, right? I had to add the missing to the installed, I had to then def divide the number of, number of installed by the by the um, by the total, and then that would give us a uh, that would give us a percent patch compliance rate. Uh, in Yellowfin, we just have that as a um, we just have that as an as a field in here, so we don't even have to go hand calculate that anymore. Now, I'd love to show you guys if you want to see how to do that. That's a a thing we certainly can do. Um, but you know, if we look at it, if we look at it here, there's uh, well, let's see. This one's a little easier to do some math on, right? So 250 patches installed out of a total of about 1,600. Looks like there's about 
85% patch compliance. If there's 42 patches missing out of 1,300 patches installed, 96% <clears throat> patch compliance. Uh, and of course, we're gonna want our, um, there's gonna be a filter in here somewhere for the, uh, uh, for showing only the latest run data. Now, why does that matter? We basically have five runs of patching information for the server uh, .81 from when it was missing a lot of patches to when it was missing some patches to when it was missing no patches. And we only care about the latest information. So I'm gonna drag that in as a filter. And that should, let's see, that should give us some less information. All right, so, uh, but for whatever reason it's not. Uh, but the thing that's nice is now I see that percent patch compliance I'm much more confident in that. Um, other thing we can do is we can uh, pull in the is latest run field uh, and go filter on that. I don't know why it wants to summarize all these things. So we will summary none. And then we can just filter on and only show the is latest run. Now we may have more than one patch analysis job. Um, uh, we may have more than one patch analysis job looking at the same server. And so it may also be helpful to filter by patch analysis job. Uh, um, and that can be that can be very helpful. Uh, let's see, we're gonna go say is latest run and set that to equal to, come on, equal to value. And I'm going to just define that value to be one because I only want the latest info. And that is a nice and easy way to get that. All right, great. So now that we know we have patch percent patch compliance and we don't need these fields, we can delete them. Let's see. Come in here and delete. And that'll take a sec to refresh. Come in here and delete that one. Now the other thing that we said we were gonna do was we were gonna go grab a patch server property field. And the field we're gonna go grab is we're gonna go grab customer as long as it's in here. And it should be in here. There we are, customer. Now why do we want customer? Because overall we want our information to be in here by line of business, right? So there's my customer field. That's gonna be my primary field that I wanna see in here. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna let me roll up my patch compliance numbers. And those patch compliance numbers are not terrible, right? You know, I see in here uh, some 100% results, some very nice results in here. Um, I want to be able to roll these results up by that line of business, right? And what, the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna roll it up by operating system. But in order to do that, I need to take the individual host names out of this, out of this uh, report, right? Uh, and so when I delete the server name, what it's going to do is it's going to automatically average up those rates by the major operating systems. I'm going to actually just delete this field. I don't necessarily want to see it. And I do have some servers in my environment that don't have customer settings on them. Shame on me. Uh, but now when I go through, I basically can get numbers for the different uh, specific operating system versions, uh, and that will give me some nice, uh, uh, some nice patch compliance numbers in here. Now, what the, you can use this to do, if you wanted to even go in and, uh, um, you know, do a, a less detailed version of this, you can roll this up to by particular operating system. And so that you can say for a particular, um, uh, for a particular, um, uh, where am I? Let's see. For a particular um, uh, line of business and uh, operating system version, uh, we're at a particular level of compliance. And so you can use that to highlight for any given part of the organization. You can use that to highlight that, um, um, you know, that, that that part of the business is doing a better job or a worse job in a particular operating, in a particular operating system. So one thing we wanted to do last on here was come in and show some, con, some conditional value highlighting. Because obviously this is basically a wall of statistics and it's only so, only so useful, only so interesting. 
Um, and what we want to do is we want to come in and format. And formatting is one of my favorite things in this. What it's going to do is it's going to, I like to do background highlighting. Uh, and I'm basically going to build three rules. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start and I'm going to say uh, anybody that's less than, say, 90% compliance, uh, I'm going to do some background fill and I'm going to make that red, right? Red or in this case, orange. Orange is a little more readable. Uh, and I'm going to put that in. Then I'm going to add another rule. And I'm going to say if it's uh, uh, between, basically greater than, sorry, between uh, 90% and 95%, I'm going to say, all right, maybe that's okay, right? And obviously, this is going to be different in every every environment based on your math, based on the rules that uh, cover uh, the, the your um, uh, that your group uses to measure uh, patching compliance. And so in this environment, and it may be anything better than a 95, probably not a 95, probably needs to be a little higher than 95, but makes for a good example here. Um, and let's see, that needs to be less than or equal to, because otherwise you'll have things that end up not. So that basically gives us a range. Anything under 90 is going to be red or orange. Anything 90 to 95 comes in as yellow. Anything better will show as green. And that will nicely give us labels on our columns and show us, you know, which lines of business. You know, if I go look over at this fair weather insurance, and I do see more rows than I'm supposed to over here, and I'm not sure why that is, but I'll figure it out, and I'll let you guys know another time. Uh, but if I look over at fair weather insurance, their Linux, some parts of their Linux environment are doing okay, they're green, other parts are yellow or red. All of their Windows boxes are below standard, right? So that's going to be a conversation we're going to have. If I look at Sunny Healthcare, uh, you know, the healthcare department of our organization, um, none of their servers are up to spec, right? But I come up to Calvro Bank and, you know, a good portion of their Linux environment for whatever reason is showing green. Awesome. Now, if I'm one of these businesses that's struggling, I might want to go make sure that, you know, some of my more compliant servers aren't hiding in this group over here. I want to go make sure that I've got customer tags set on those systems. Uh, but this can this can become a very um, uh, a very nice little report. One other thing that uh, that um, customers will often ask for is they'll say, okay, 100% compliance across how many? And so one thing you can do is you can come over and pull the some scan server count, and that tells you how many servers are actually in scope. Now, being three being 99% compliant over three servers isn't really all that impressive, right? If you've got 156 servers that are only at 89% compliance, uh, but that's a that's a good field to add into your report. So I'm going to go ahead and publish this uh, because we only have so much time, and I do also want to get into uh, doing a compliance BIOS. But you guys are kind of getting a sense of how to start building these reports. Uh, so this is uh, patch compliance. Looks like I must have my caps lock on. Uh, patch compliance. Uh, and, you know, if I were being particularly wordy, I might say patch compliance rate, but I just rates usually implied uh, by line of business. And uh, that still doesn't belong in change tracking, so I'm going to put it in patching. And we went and looked at some of those detailed fields, and now we have a reliable report. Now. If I own one of these lines of business, I'm going to want this report in my inbox every single, um, basically every single week. Uh, and so I'm going to, go to want to go broadcast that, and basically uh, schedule it. Uh, and I'm going to schedule that so that it goes out to a common team. Uh, I'm going to send this to Seth Paskin, who is our uh, CIO uh, for the purpose of this. And unfortunately, Seth does not exist in the um, Seth does not exist in this organization. Uh, also, you probably don't want to send this to admin at yellowfin.com, but I'm sure there'll be a there'll be a user that you want to send it to. And this is going to be patching by line of business. And I will usually attach either as a CSV or a PDF. Um, PDFs tend to be a little more readable on uh, mobile devices. Um, pretty handy. You can also go in and filter by a particular line of business and just give people their information versus the environment information for the entire environment. That may be handy. And since I want my results to go out uh, every Monday morning, uh, I may want it to go out at, uh, let's see, Merca. 
I don't know where Dawson's Creek is, but let's try New York. There we go, N for New York, and send it out at 5 a.m. Now, the nice thing is you schedule this thing to run Monday mornings at 5 a.m. By the time everybody comes in the office, they've got this report, and it's showing up in their inbox. So that's pretty convenient. Um, schedule that. Now that'll get automatically broadcast, and we have just enough time for one more quick report, and we'll try to go through that one very quickly. Uh, so compliance. And you guys saw we did uh, patching by line of business. This one's not going to be uh, much different. So again, we're going to look for compliance. Now, the other thing that we're going to want is we're going to want the name of the compliance template. Uh, and that's going to be a bigger factor because you may have many compliance policies in your environment. Um, you may have many compliance policies in your environment. Um, but what you're going to find is you're going to find that there's going to be a select few that you're going to want to filter for, and you're not going to want to report on every single uh, every single compliance policy. And you may end up doing the same thing over in the uh, over in the patching workspace as well. <laughs> Looks like I managed to uh, manage to trip every single. Uh, uh, there we go. Turn off auto refresh. Turn it back on. Have it show us some stuff. Let's uh, try throwing that away. And anytime you get into a report that doesn't show you anything or runs way too long, feel free to just throw. Uh, feel free to just throw the. Um, uh, you know, go back and throw that last piece of data away and get your results again. Uh, and you know, see if it comes back to showing you something that's. Uh, um, uh, showing you something that makes a little more sense. Uh, so common thing, policy name, uh, never hurts to have then your, uh, uh, your, basic, your basic percent compliance. Uh, and that'll show you uh, your overall, we definitely don't want some percent of compliance, we just want compliance and that should give us a nice uh, one to 100, there we go. Uh, I always like to put in the uh, the rule stats because when somebody looks at something, they say, oh, well, you know, I've got my percent compliance number. What is that based on, right? How many rules were actually checked? So CIS for Red Hat Linux, 233 rules uh, checked, 101 rules compliant, 132 non-compliant, basically about 40% uh, compliance. Come in and do our nice, pretty conditional formatting again. Uh, where we go in and add our rules real quick, uh, anything uh, less than, and I'm, I, I would never say that, I would never say that 60% is a great number to be at, um, but, you know, you may need to, you may need to build a report like this um, where, you know, you may, you may start with, um, uh, you may start with uh, a number like, um, like 60% is the starter value, uh, because you don't want to make anybody feel bad when you show them re results, right? Uh, if you show them something that, that's going to get people really excited and not in a good way, um, you may want to go, um, uh, you may want to go, you know, think about, hey, how can I make this look gentler while we're bringing people up to speed on compliance? All right, so there's our conditional compliance. And that'll give us some nice, pretty numbers over on the right side. And the last thing we need to do is go pull in that compliance server property. Oh, sorry. Uh, pull in major operating system because we said we were going to go by operating system over here. And again, you could pull over line of business, but uh, let's see, where is OS? Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, why don't we go, where is OS Maker? Oh, OS name will have to do. And then now we have those compliance numbers and we understand it. You can either use this as a, as a detailed report at a high level uh, and, you know, show people the, the individual levels for the individual different policies. Um, or you can roll this stuff, you can roll this stuff up to a higher level and basically throw away the, uh, uh, the rule details. I do not know why that particular thing is taking so long to run, but uh, I'm going to turn that off and back on. And uh, I see that we have about four minutes left, and I did want to get to some questions. Uh, 
Uh, I think you guys get the get the gist of where we're going with this uh, across the board. Um, I'm going to go. Let's see. Do we have an is latest? Uh, and you can get uh, much more detailed stuff. You can get into the um, you can get into the individual results by server, all that sort of thing. Um, and you can you know you can get really down into the weeds on this thing. I don't want to do that for this. Uh, um, for the purposes of what we're doing here, but um, I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Uh, questions or concerns, uh, Seth? Did you have any on your list that you wanted to make sure we were able to hit for uh, for other people's uh, edification? So it's a, a good it's a great question. Thank you, Sean. Um, but so light on you, time. Yeah, you're doing great. Um, for those of you who posted yeah, yeah. questions in chat instead of in the Q and A, I think Sumit and Devendra and, and uh, Musa have been trying to keep keep up with those, but. It's very hard for me to see and tell whether questions have been answered in the chat window, but let me see. Uh, there's a lot of questions about patches. So is it possible to get the release date of the patches from TSSR? Um, uh, if it's got it, and we can certainly, I can certainly go look. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and save and publish this guy. Uh, and we will show this uh, compliance. This is for um, uh, Nidhi. So Nidhi, pay attention here. We're trying to answer your question from chat. Sure. Let me go save this and we will go look. I think you can get some release information, basically anything that comes from, you know, anything that we can see over in the underlying patch catalog. Um, you know, you may need to make sure that a property is checked uh, to come over into, um, you may need to, Make sure that a, a property is checked to publish into reports. Um, but you know, as long as that information is uh, is available to us, you know, my my general impression is that uh, if we have that information, we've done a pretty pretty solid job of um, uh, making sure that that information can be uh, can be shown in reporting. Uh, so I don't see the release date, but we may have a. Uh, we may have a, like a date created or something for when that patch came into server automation. So there's compliance summary by OS. Uh, as we mentioned, let's go look at that last one. And then um, were there, that would be under patch model detail. And uh, by the way, for those of you who don't have TrueSight Smart Reporting implemented in a non-prod environment, uh, I will note that it is the 8th of August. Uh, and today is a great day to get that installed and running in your environment so that you can be ahead of the Cognos migration or the, the Cognos deadline at the end of the month. Uh, so let's see, uh, patch information. Let's go see, date posted would be your thing. And then was the question around like when, when the patch came into the system or what was the question? The question is, can you, can you have the release date of patches? Can you get the release date of the patches from here? Yeah. Yeah, so it looks like date it. posted? Yeah. Okay. Yep. yep. All right. Um, let's see. There were we can always go, we can always go filter. You know, I like to go spot check these things to make sure that I'm, that I'm understanding the right thing and I'm looking at the right thing. Um, so if I filter by, let's just sort. I mean, sort is an easy thing to do, right? If we sort by the bulletin ID, that should give us some dates posted. Sorry, uh, other questions? Uh, uh, somebody posted that uh, Red Hat and Oracle doesn't have a patch release date. I think we've got some information about like when we got the information from the from the vendor, um, and so you may be able to use that as a as a stop stop gap. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, if we don't if we don't have the information, we can't obviously expose it. If yeah. the vendor doesn't provide it, then there's there's very little that can be done. So here's right. here's what I'd like to do, Sean. I'm going to Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to share the Q and A and the chat transcripts when I post the recording. Um, we'll make so, sure to get some good answers on them. Yeah, I'll try to clean it up a little bit if I have time. Sure. Um, yeah. But uh, I wanted to 
If you have follow-up questions, so Sean, first of all, do you want to talk about what you want to do next week on the session we're going to have next week? Right. So one of the things, the big thing we're going to want to do next week is we're going to do advanced uh, reporting. And so that is going to include uh, how to do drill throughs, uh, basically how to link two reports to, to each other. And the other thing I want to do, I know that in a lot of our customer environments, we end up doing SQL queries. Now, 99%, I think, I honestly believe that 99% of all reports can be built out using these models, right, if you go find the right thing. Um, but we also know, um, uh, we also know that uh, some of this, some of this information, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you, you, there may just be something that you need to run a SQL query for. And so we're going to show how to go do that. Okay. Um, we're going to do drill throughs. I think we'll probably do some charting, uh, but I'm open to feedback on other things that people would like to see. But, uh, you know, the, the, oh, uh, and the last one is building a dashboard. So we'll build dashboards, we'll show drill, through, drill throughs, and then we'll do, uh, we'll do a SQL query. And that should probably cover us uh, pretty nicely for what we want to, um, uh, for what we want to cover for, um, uh, for reporting. Okay, Does that great. work for everybody? Yeah. yeah. So here's what I'll do, folks. Let me just wrap this up. And Sean, thank you so much Please. for, for this tour de force <clears throat> um, presentation. <laughs> Sorry, we went pretty fast, right? <laughs> um, so folks, in the Q&A, uh, we, we are also, we've, the support team has been putting together video series to support this. So we've got a bunch of videos we're, we've posted and are continuing to produce. I'll make sure to include a link to those in the, uh, when I post the recording and in the event window. Um, and I will create uh, a new event.